Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. As always, before we get started, a few reminders. If you want to ask a question and we value your questions, please hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen. There you will see a Q&A button. If you push that Q&A button, uh, a pop-up comes up and you can type in your question there. You can answer a question at any time during the presentation. We will get to the questions after the presentation and get, as, get through as many as possible. If we do not get through all the questions, we will ask our presenter today to answer the remaining questions offline, and we will post them together with a recording of today's presentation on our website. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Anthony Stagliano. Um, I actually met Tony uh, when he first came to FAU a year or two ago, and uh, we all we knew about Tony was that his specialty was rhetoric. And so I went with a certain expectation to his office learning about rhetoric, and I was very surprised when I learned what Tony's actual research interest is. So Tony is, is a scholar of rhetoric and film and media, and his research concerns are really creative interventions into technologies of surveillance. And that's what he's going to talk about today. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to him. Welcome, Tony. Hi, thank you very much for having me here. It's, it's my great pleasure to be here. And I hope everybody enjoys this. Uh, this is some stuff I've been thinking about for a little while now. Um, as you can see here, our title is, let me just double check with that. Okay, okay. Um, as you can see here, our, our title for today is Hacking Surveillance, Creative Tactics to Avoid Being Seen. And we'll talk a little bit about what um, that means when we talk about creative tactics. In our increasingly digitally mediated culture, our bodies, and especially our faces, have come to play a privileged, interesting, and at times chilling role in how we go about our lives, interacting with ubiquitous but mundane and often invisible computer systems. That is, when it comes to our public selves, either as we move through physical space on our way to work or to Publix, or in more obviously digital spaces, such as browsing the internet or using social media, our activity is enabled by and mediated through complex computing systems that track and trace us to a degree that we are usually unaware of. <clears throat> Surveillance in the traditional sense of it, like these cameras here, of course, is one part of this, which we'll think a lot about today, but it's really only one part. What's worth thinking about is how our everyday lives are affected by the total presence of such systems and what creative means are available for interacting with them differently. To understand this a little more, let's start with faces. Faces are quite useful for us interacting with the many networked devices and systems that are meant for their part to make our lives easier. If you have one of the more recent iPhones, you can use your face to unlock it by simply looking at it in the right way. That saves you the time of fumbling to type in the four or six digit code or to hold your thumb over, the, over it the right way. Many airlines, meanwhile, such as JetBlue, are testing similar technology to replace boarding passes. Your face is quickly scanned on the way onto the plane and you and the ticket agent don't have to do that dance of fumbling to get your boarding pass scanned either on paper or on your iPhone, which of course has to be unlocked. In China, with as with a much more fully implemented system, many public transportation systems don't use tickets and turnstiles, but a similar facial recognition scheme, which scans people boarding trains and deducts their fare automatically from their transit accounts online, similar to using the SunPass lanes here, but with your faces as the transponder. We're on Zoom today instead of in person. I'll stop myself before indulging the face-to-face -face pun. So it's worth mentioning that too. For digital cameras, Facial recognition algorithms help them focus and track to keep faces in the center of the frame and generally visible and in focus. This month, a tech firm revealed the work they have done recently using AI and facial recognition technology to improve the quality of these video streams, live video chat streams, using the AI technology that we'll talk about today. Likewise, if you use social media, such as the aptly named Facebook, you often see the platform offering to tag friends in photos you post with relatively high accuracy. So in a new way, our faces have become interfaces for interacting with all the machines we've built to make our, help make our daily life easier, more efficient, and at times more fun, as with the funny costumes and accoutrements you can use in video messaging apps. This new and easy kind of interface, however, has its own other side, another face. For all of it to work, it is also useful as a form of surveillance. The technologies that power our fun and useful devices also power complex uh, surveillance systems, 
which are themselves trained on data from our ordinary mundane uses. Meanwhile, as many researchers, users, and activists have noted, these same algorithmic systems are laden with biases and as, are as laden with biases and as problematic as are many biased and unjust non-digital systems. Computer scientist and artist Joy Bula Weenie, for instance, noticed in her uh, work on facial recognition algorithms that they are quite bad at correctly identifying the faces of Black people in general and Black women in particular. The autofocus and tracking features on digital cameras, Bula Weenie notice, notices, less frequently detect the faces of Black people who use, use them than white people. One of her activities is heading the Algorithmic Justice League, a group of AI researchers and activists whose mission is to raise public awareness of biases in AI and to conduct research in the technologies that helps develop, quote, actionable critique. In other words, that lead to changes in the technologies themselves. The rest of this talk will consider creative interventions into these problems, that of a general and diffuse surveillance culture and the problem of algorithms being unaccountable and dangerous. Many researchers, such as Ola Mwini, study these specific problems, and I'd be happy to share after this a list of ex accessible writing on, on both of these topics. My research, though, is specifically into creative manipulations of digital culture and what those interventions can tell us about how such network devices and their conveniences have changed the way we go about our ordinary lives. This activity has a long history under the name tactical media, but what is happening now is a bit different and exciting to think with. But back to surveillance for the moment. The ordinary image of surveillance, at least when we think of it involving technology, is that of this camera, installed in public places everywhere. Another compo component of that image of surveillance normally, though, is the other end of that camera. Here's an example of that security camera booth where some hapless security guard has the unenviable task of watching all of those screens all day and all night. Of course, we all implicitly know it's not usually like that anymore. What it is like, though, is sometimes rather surprising to learn. Automated facial recognition systems, that is algorithms, that perform the hapless guard's task do so at a rate and intensity that vastly exceeds human perceptual capacities and do so by learning to get better at their job at a constant clip. They also can connect to large databases, checking scanned faces against government ID data databases and the like, including um, um, uh, booking photos, uh, mugshots. The train tickets in China and the facial boarding passes that I just mentioned all operate on that same premise. Now, of course, your corner Walgreens isn't yet operating their cameras that way, and it's more likely simply recording to a hard drive in a room somewhere in, in the building. But if that hard drive were ever requested by, the, by any of the authorities, its videos would be scanned in that way by an algorithm like this, uh, not by tired agents pulling double shifts. So all of this depends on a kind of computing called machine learning. For the face-based boarding passes to work, the algorithm has to be trained on a lot of samples of images of faces so that it can recognize faces in images and compare the faces it recognized to those stored in the database. And what you're seeing here in, in this picture is one such uh, a set of research. And this, this kind of characteristic of facial recognition technology, this characteristic wireframe that lays over the face is the way the, the algorithm scans images for certain kinds of symmetries. And we'll talk about these symmetries later. Um, Think again here of the algorithm that asks you to tag your friends and uh, uh, pictures on social media. That is a core principle in, in machine learning, that the machines learn by giving a lot of, being given a lot of data to process and work with and continue to learn from. So if it suggests uh, the person in the upper left is your friend uh, Susie, and you say, well, no, that's actually not Susie, then the machine learns that that's been, that's been a mistake. And then it develops the algorithm's accuracy in, increasingly. So we're we're performing the, the work of training the algorithm by using these things. The more, uh, so for instance, when you have your phone, the more time you, your phone unlocks, the more time your face unlocks your phone in slightly different poses, in slightly different light, with slightly different backgrounds, the better your phone gets at recognizing your face as a face and as your face. So when you try to unlock it and, and it fails, then it's, and you, you push the button and it says, you know, I, I, no, that's really me, then it's training the algorithm to get better at this. Okay. Naturally, that image of surveillance is only part of the story. What is particularly interesting to consider is how all of our modes of digital convenience are themselves necessarily surveillance. Siri, Alexa, and all of our smart TVs that are voice controlled to be able to work have to listen to us a lot more than we think they are. If you use wearable health devices like the Fitbit or this uh, Apple phone, or uh, this Apple Watch, or even just a step counting app on your smartphone, you're loading these algorithms up with a ton of training data but also creating a, a digital trail that is enormously telling and revealing. 
And as we'll come to, to in a moment, everywhere you go with a network device, you leave a digital trail, which is quite accurately traceable, even when the data is supposedly anonymized. So while we're going about our lives, trying to have them run as smoothly and as easily as we can, those aiding devices are learning how to get better at aiding, but they are doing so by watching and by listening and as well as following. This is where privacy researchers and activists of many different stripes have come to be concerned. There are multiple different avenues that groups and individuals have taken in raising the questions of mundane digital surveillance, including campaigns by the ACLU and by technology critics and researchers like the Algorithmic Justice League that I just talked about, aimed at raising public awareness or a direct change in policy, law, and practice. Many researchers in a number of fields, from sociology to political science, have studied and worked on such projects. What I am interested in and what, this, what we'll think about today for the rest of this talk is like I mentioned earlier, creative interventions into these digital tools and, and systems. Creative artistic misuses or perversions of digital and media systems have a long and often funny history while itself teaching us a bit about how to interact with these machines differently. Now in the study of rhetoric, as Karen mentioned when she introduced me, my main disciplinary world is rhetoric, so I think of these things through the lens of that. Um, in the study of rhetoric, we talk about tropes, as in tropes and figures, and this is the kind of linguistic phenomenon, which will be useful for thinking about what these things do, what these creative interventions do. In classical Greek rhetoric, according to the Roman orator Quintilian, um, tropes were the transference of expressions from their natural and principal uh, signification to another with a view of the, and the embellishment of style. In other words, a trope was a rhetorical stylized misuse of language. That word, the word trope means turning in Greek, right? It's connected to the word uh, in Greek that means turning. And it's the Greek equivalent of the Latin suasion in persuasion. So when you persuade someone, you turn them toward what you want them to believe or think or feel. Plants that follow the sun throughout the day are called heliotropic, that is sun turning. So I want us to think about, so I want us to see the following projects as creatively rhetorical in that sense, as attempts, sometimes quite playful, sometimes more serious, at turning our network technologies just a bit away from their normal functioning or at turning our interactions with them a bit away from their normal functioning, our own interactions are being turned to. Turning, them, turning these devices and turning our relationships to these devices does a couple of things, I think. One, it gives us a model for different ways of interacting with our networked world a range of more engaged, active, and involved ways of act interacting with them. Two, I think many of these projects are quite good at shocking us into awareness of the need for, more involved, for that more involved, engaged interaction with these devices. Like I've mentioned earlier, our, our, network, our, our network world isn't always only about faces. Here's a quick look at a tongue-in-cheek hack that reminds us about uh, the mundane tracking and tracing that goes on into making our lives convenient now. If you've ever relied on your GPS navigation system here in South Florida, you'll know that the most useful feature is the one that tells us about traffic conditions. And here I, I snapped this, I think, yesterday in, in mid-afternoon, so traffic around Boca wasn't so bad, but you see a little bit of red and a little bit of orange, and you know that those places are quite slow. Um, so the way these GPS systems know uh, the traffic conditions is through the cell phones in, in, in each of the cars pinging to the local uh, cell phone towers. The more cell phones moving slowly or not at all through an area, the more traffic the map shows, the more red that spot is. So th this is the hack. German artist uh, Simon Weckert uh, figured out a simple way of perversely tweaking the traffic data on Google Maps. He walked around his neighborhood in Berlin with 99 cell phones in a wagon. Here he is with this red wagon. Because there were so many of them and they were crawling along at walking speed, Google Maps showed a severe traffic jam right there. And, and he walked right by Google Berlin's headquarters. Um, uh, so because there were so many of them and they were crawling along at walking speed, Google Maps showed a severe traffic jam wherever he went. Anyone who's been frustrated by real traffic jams might rightly uh, think hack, Vecker's hack more irritating than funny. But I think it illustrates something that a lot, all of these projects involved, uh, uh, involving chases, faces show a bit more subtly that we, in incorporating these complex but largely opaque systems in our lives, give over a bit of agency to them, that it isn't too hard to reclaim in small ways by interacting with them a little differently. The normal ex expectation that we, how we interact with them, of course, isn't just simply that we're passive users in an or the ordinary sense, but active users in precisely limited ways. 
Uh, that is, Facebook and Google Maps depend on people actively using them. So it's not a, a difference between Vecard as being active and interacting with it and our normal interactions are, are passive. It's a different kind of act, active use. That is, Facebook and Google Maps depend on us actively using them and using them a lot, but in rather narrow ways. Vecard's wagon, full of cell phones, it hacks Google Maps, right? But it only does it by interacting with it in an unexpected way. He hack, his hack floods it with information the, with data, and it responds accordingly, but gives other users false information that there's a traffic jam in front of the Google Berlin headquarters when there is not. As you see him standing there, there's plenty of room for cars. If you happen to be driving over that bridge and hadn't turned on Google Maps or any other navigation system, you wouldn't have encountered a traffic jam. It might have been excused for not even noticing a man on the sidewalk pulling a kid's wagon full of cell phones. Now, as tongue-in-cheek as Veckert's project is, the issue of facial recognition surveillance in public places is a bit more fraught, okay? Uh, last year, which admittedly seems like centuries ago, protests raged for nearly the whole year and spilling into this year in Hong Kong against expanding juridical control over the province by mainland China and, as, and for as long in Chile's capital, uh, Santiago, over rising public transportation prices and university tuition, expanding so that the Chilean protests expanded into demands for a new constitution that would strip away, strip away any vestige of the Pinochet constitution of the 1970s. This year, of course, uh, we have ongoing protests, not just in the US, but in many places around the world in opposition to continued racial violence at the hands of police. In all of these cases, there has been concern that people are encountering facial recognition regimes increasingly bent on making the public appearances of the face useful for policing and generally discouraging participation in protest events. Many ad hoc avoidance strategies, for instance, emerged out of the protests in Hong Kong and Santiago, including the now famous uh, images of laser pointers in both cities being used to blind police drones. So in, in the protests in Hong Kong and, and Santiago, uh, police would fly drones in, and I think a lot of people know that the commercial drones that you can buy have video cameras on them. So police were flying the drones over the cities, uh, the protesters, and trying to get facial recognition data to identify people. And people found that the cheap little laser pointers that you usually use to tease your cat um, were quite good at blinding those drones and, and, and sometimes making them crash. While the current protests, I'm thinking now of the ones that are ongoing now, uh, while the current protests have the advantage of public pressure for people to wear face covering to protect them against the coronavirus, many facial recognition researchers have suggested that their systems are simply learning how to recognize faces partially covered in that manner. So the, the facial recognition researchers are now focusing a lot of their, their algorithmic efforts on the, the upper part, part of the faces. The issue then is, with troping facial recognition in public is to put the functioning of these systems into motion in a way that makes it harder for the authorities to anchor us in the face and by the face, and just as important to shock people into awareness of the ease and ubiquity of these systems, the ease and ubiquity of, of us being recognized by these automated systems. Oh, I'm gonna have a sip of water. To thwart the key algorithm that most of these facial recognition technologies use, a few years ago, a media artist, uh, the media artist activist, Adam Harvey, developed this project uh, which he called CV Dazzle. CV uh, is short for computer vision. Um, and so the, the main set of uh, uh, facial recognition, computer vision data, the, the big library of com computer vision algorithms, including the facial recognition ones, is called OpenCV. It's an open source library that anybody who's a programmer or a developer can use. Um, and so that's why it's called CV Dazzle. It's, it's called um, uh, to dazzle computer vision. As you can see from these pictures, uh, and he, he has the top two or no faces detected, and the bottom two, the faces detected. Uh, CV Dazzle, it's a scheme of odd makeup and hairstyles that confuse or dazzle the algorithm that scans photos or videos for human faces. Um, he gets the name Dazzle from a style of camouflage used in World War I that was used to hide uh, supply ships in the open sea. So when, when ships were sailing across the Atlantic in the open sea, they were quite visible to submarines, but this painting scheme on, on the ships made it not impossible to see them, but impossible to get the sense of where they were, how far they were, how big they were, and which direction they were going. So the interesting thing for um, um, uh, Harvey's project, this one, right? Uh, what's interesting about this as camouflage is that 
as you can see here in these pictures, it addresses itself as camouflage to the algorithm, not to human eyes. If you already you know, put on this hair and makeup scheme and walk around or participate in a protest, you would be more visible, not less visible to, to the human police, right? So this is, it, it's camouflage just for the algorithm. So, it, so CB Dazzle strikes me as interesting in that it evolves composing a different relationship with the technical system of facial recognition. To make CB Dazzle, uh, it was not simply a matter of, of Adam Harvey coming up with strange makeup styles like these that were effective at confusing the algorithms. Instead, it took a long recursive process of him learning the code, trying to understand how it encounters faces and refining the hair and makeup schemes in close observation of the algorithm's responses, successes, and failures. It is in this dual sense, I think, that we can think of projects like this as subtly disobedient tropes of the technologies, such as the face, facial recognition algorithms. Harvey's research, in fact, is linked to the website for OpenCV, and that's the, the big library, the open source set of computer vision algorithms that power uh, most of the facial recognition software in use now. So while the project is a kind of protest against facial recognition in public, it is now, in a way, a part of the knowledge database that makes up that ever-changing technology. Um, and this is what I mean when I say that projects like this trope the technology. They turn it in a way that, that may be temporary, uh, but also results in other surprising twists. Um, for instance, as you can see here, that project, uh, Harvey CB Dazzle, uh, precipitated a number of further refinements and variations conducted by a host of other artists, activists, and generally curious people. And so uh, I almost filled this page with, with hundreds of these. If you go onto YouTube, and do anti-surveillance makeup tutorial. There's hundreds and hundreds of these videos, different vernacular attempts at it. Um, one of these, this lower uh, left one, is from Vogue magazine. And then uh, this other one is a group of artists in London uh, that call themselves the Dazzle, the Dazzle Squad. Um, and that's coverage in, in um, The Guardian, um, the large newspaper in, in London. And here's one that was posted just this month um, by the Russian performance art uh, the, by the Russian performance art group Pussy Riot. And, and of course, they gained international fame for being jailed by uh, Vladimir Putin several years ago. So while Harvey had to learn to code to truly understand the algorithms that work in facial recognition schemes, many of these artists are free to experiment and build on that work of each other and of Harvey's work in a more open and, and kind of vernacular way. And I think this is what I mean by this kind of, this troping and creative manipulation. Um, let's look at a couple more projects. Uh, Netherlands-based Taiwanese artist Jin Kai Lu developed this prototype in 2018, uh, what she calls, as you can see here, a wearable face projector. Uh, Lu's project was a part of a broader set of projects at this, this art school that she's uh, attended in um, uh, Amsterdam, uh, and the group projects were under the, the title Dystopian Futures. She and several artists contributed to this, aiming to imagine a future where facial recognition is more advanced than it is now, and developing artistic strategies for moving through public spaces protected, as Lou claims, from, quote, privacy violations. Um, so what you can see here is that, that this is a, a video projector, and as you're walking around, it projects a, a rotating array of other faces on top of yours. And so to Lou, the, the projected faces superimposed upon your own allow you the comfort of being in public while revealing a face that doesn't necessarily reveal your own identity. Lou's concern isn't just the police, but a not too far off future where advertisers see you in public and broadcast targeted ads to you everywhere, like this famous moment in the dystopian film Minority Report, where the protagonist, played by uh, Tom Cruise, is, is bombarded by uh, hologram target ads as he goes through a shopping mall. So this is a, a like Facebook or social media with all the advertising that's very highly targeted advertising because the algorithms know a ton about you. Um, but instead of simply on the, the uh, social media feed, he's actually walking through, it's not even a mall, I, I think he's in his, his office building, and he's being bombarded with all these different ads for Bulgari and Lexus. He's apparently quite affluent. Um, of course, Lou's project is not meant to, to be taken straight face, right? As you can see in, the image, in these images of it, uh, it would be uncomfortable, right? To, to, and a bit blinding to have this projector blast other faces into your own as you walk around town. Uh, but it is worth thinking about how close we genuinely are to realizing that this future that it warns us against. Um, but more interesting to me uh, is like the makeup schemes that we just looked at, it operates by tweaking or troping the ordinary function of the facial recognition scheme. It hacks it, but doesn't hack into it, right? It, if that makes any sense. It, 
and it does so not quite by denying it what it wants, a, a face, but by giving it a sure fit of changing faces on the same body. Um, so this project, I think, is, is similar in spirit to an, another one that's interesting by Leonardo, Leonardo Salvaggio, a Chicago-based artist. And this project is called You're Me, U-R-M-E. Uh, and this one is, is one in which he makes his own face available for others to wear as a 3D printed mask. From his website, and this is the, the part on the page of his website, you can download the print file to print yourself a copy of Leonardo Savaggio's face if you have a 3D printer. Um, um, and, and so Savaggio's project, instead of offering multiple, like Lou's, right, instead of offering changing face, multiple changing faces on one body, he takes the opposite tack, offering an unlimited number of copies of the same face on as many bodies as, as are willing to wear it. While this obviously resembles a Halloween mask, or, or better still, the mask that the, the villain in, in the Halloween movies, uh, Michael Myers, wears, it's worth noting, by tweaking the face equals identity formula, Salvaggio offers not a generic invented face, but genuinely his own. This is a copy of his face. So when you walk around with it on, you are potentially triggering his identity being picked out and picked up by the public systems, right? Of course, he's possibly and potentially in several other places at the same time. And then in February of this year, uh, this one was kind of one of my favorites, in response to a very different problem of public facial faciality came this project from the design firm Resting Risk Face, and they call this Face ID Masks which are face ID compa compatible respiratory masks for those who still need to use their faces to access their phones while wearing masks to protect them against uh, a pandemic. Like the other project I just mentioned, this one admits uh, to having started as a joke, but I wanna draw our attention to the tactical and experimental possibilities projects like this open up. That is what I think all of these examples make evident is both that the nature of ordinary public life and selfhood and the powers that intersect there is different now in our networked world and the nature of the technologies of disobedience available there is also changed. So for instance, a project like Harvey's CV Dazzle, and this is the makeup scheme uh, down here on the left, the one that thwarts the facial recognition algorithms, this can be seen as a model of rhetorically inflected critical analysis of code. It probes how the algorithm works, what its limits are, what its assumptions are, and arrives at an intervention designed for that specific audience, the algorithm, right? Of course, as with the work uh, Bulam Weenie does with, uh, um, her algorithmic justice league, not all of this kind of work needs to be ironic or humorous. But I think the outrageous tongue in cheek and impractical form uh, of the projects that I just discussed isn't a flaw or a shortcoming, but it's something that can draw our attention to the invisible ubiquity of our devices and network systems, jokingly perhaps, right? Uh, shocking us into awareness of the things that by design recede into the background, right? That, that, you know, by design, we, we shouldn't have to be aware of these things at all times. But that power to shock isn't the only thing that is interesting about these projects. If I want anything to linger in your minds after this talk, it is the, the involved, trained interaction with digital systems that these projects perform. I want you to see in them something useful, not in any specific form, like a helmet-mounted projector, but in a style of interaction, amateur and experimental vernacular ways to trope, turn, and redirect our digital sentinels and companions, that we may be less passive in our relationship with them. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, just as a reminder, if you have any questions of our presenter today, please hover your mouse in the bottom of your screen. There is a Q&A button that you can push on and type your question. Um, all right, Tony, um, I'll, uh, when you present particularly the makeup features mm -hmm. of uh, how you can prevent the uh, face recognition, it seems like it's the area underneath your, your eyes and then your, your forehead. Is that all that really, like if I have my phone and do the facial recognition to unlock it, is that all that these facial recognition programs use? I, so, I would expect that the eyes and the mouse maybe, but. So the, 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 it's called the um, Viola Jones algorithm named for the, uh, the two researchers that developed this particular algorithm. Uh, I forget their first names, but their last names are Viola and Jones respectively. And what th those algorithms discovered is that the way to do facial recognition is look for symmetry patterns. So the first thing, right, when you give a computer vision uh, an image is it doesn't, know, because it's not a person looking at the image, it first has to just like find patterns of object, like patterns in the pixels that might tell it this is potentially a face. And so 
the eyes are one of those first places because it's symmetries. And so people who have, who have in, injuries or uh, I had a friend who had um, Bell's palsy, which is that kind of idiopathic palsy that comes and goes um, and it affects the shape of their faces. Um, so it's, it's an, you know, there's kind of an ableism in, in the algorithms, but so what they look for is particular um, symmetries. And so what the black and white makeup on like the ships in the open sea, it, it gives it more of those symmetries and throws off the balance relationship of the symmetries. So then the, the algorithm sees some of the symmetries of a face, but not enough of them for it to be convinced that it is a face. And so it moves on in the, the scan of the image, continuing to look elsewhere. Um, Great. And, so, so nowadays with the mask on, uh, most of our facial recognition doesn't work anymore, right? So is that because that symmetry is being lost or there's not enough of symmetry because the, the um, program only sees above the mask basically in the eyes up, uh, so it doesn't recognize you as a, as a face anymore or why does the, uh, the recognition doesn't work anymore? Right, right, right. And so that was what like two of those, two of the things I mentioned were one, the the kind of joking face masks that you print your face onto it so you can get into your phone with the mask on. Right. And then the other is that several of the, the researchers who are developing these, these facial recognition algorithms now are simply working on a, a, a better algorithm that focuses on the top part of the, right. the face and they think they can crack it pretty soon. So all it, it, my interest is that these things are in a constant rate of training and development and transformation. And we're, we're thinking about not machines in the sense that you build a tank and then there's a tank, but we're, you know, and you put up a, a barricade in the road that the tank can't get over, but it's a tank that as soon as you put a barricade up, it learns about the barricade and then learns how to maneuver around it. And so the barricade is somehow part of the tank system. And, and that's what the, the facial recognition algorithms are like. And, and coming to that learning you mentioned earlier, that's basically what your phone or any other device you might have that has facial recognition on it does, right? It learns continuously as the more often you use it, the more it learns that this is you and this is, well, first that it's a person and a face and then that this is you. Uh, and my question actually was, can it learn to the extent that even though now you're wearing a face mask, if you do it often enough, will it learn that it's still you even though now you're wearing a mask? I, I'm not sure yet about that. It seems like there, this is the thing that the research, so I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a, a, I guess a critic of this kind of stuff and, and I don't work with machine learning a lot. I, I dabble in it enough to, to learn a little more about how it works. But those frontier cases, I, I, I read about what people are saying and, and what I've read is that they're still working on making, you know, masked faces visible to the, the system. Very interesting. Now, coming to the dangers, and that's, that's from what I understand you're more interested in, right? Mm -hmm. How much of our world already relies on or um, has facial recognition that we may not even be aware of and how is, is it legal basically to have like, let's say we're going to a mall, is the mall uh, allowed to use facial recognition for whatever purpose uh, or do they need consent for it? I know we, we're using it on phones and, and smart devices and we're, we're knowingly using it there, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, how many of the places that we are unknowingly being um, monitored uh, are there and uh, is it allowable? You, you mentioned in China, the, the boarding pass or the, the airport check basically. Do we have anything like that here in the US? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we don't. So one of the, the examples very early was uh, about a year ago, uh, JetBlue started rolling out right. these based um, boarding passes. And it was kind of a slow acceptance. And then of course, nobody started, everybody stopped flying, right? So the airline industry collapsed. And so um, it, it remains to be seen um, if that receives a broader kind of acceptance. But the question of, you know, are you being surveilled in public everywhere you go? The answer is yes, you are. And it's and it, so it's not just about uh, faces. You, you know, in, in Florida, right, you, you, you have the advantage of not hitting a toll booth on toll roads because of machine learning systems that are taking these flash pictures of your license plate every time you're going through. And it's not a person scanning those like, oh, this is Karen Scarbonato's license plate. Let me deduct uh, $2.50 from her from her SunPass account. That's a machine learning algorithm that gets better with more traffic, then it gets more refined because of the false ones, right? 
And then the false ones often are uh, pitted against in, in something called a generative adversarial network. The false ones sometimes are pitted against another one that's trying to trick them. And that's a different kind of machine learning system um, that I didn't get a chance to talk to, about today. But we are, I mean, so if you go to the mall and they have the security cameras everywhere and the security cameras, you know, are recording probably to a hard drive, um, but it's any video footage, any picture of you is, a, can be presented to a, a facial recognition algorithm. And depending on the situation and the use, right, it, it, it may just be one that can recognize there are 10 fa faces in this. There are people in this and not necessarily there is Tony in this, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the next question here, but maybe you will. Is there a point at which our faces go from being private to public, uh, for example, in different settings, indoors versus outdoors? I would say, so a, a different version of this, this talk that I've given and in, in the version of it that's a chapter in the book starts with the premise that a face is always a public phenomenon. Um, that our face as a thing that is a form of identity is public in the sense that it is only part of our identity because it is useful to typically other people, right? Um, and so the face equals identity relationship already introduces the probability, or not probability, already introduces the, the problem that a face is inherently public, even though it's the, the, you know, one of the most private things about us because that's why it's identity. You know, my face doesn't look like anybody else's face mm -hmm. unless I ask people to print up you know, Tony faces all over the place. Um, and so then when we think about the relationship between public and private in that way, right, then the question about wh where's the threshold when we leave our space, we want, we, we all of the, the artists and researchers I, I surveyed here are concerned about privacy in, in the sense that the questioner sounds like they are too, and I am too, right? Um, but the interesting thing for me is that some of these projects and some of these researchers and some of these invite the question about where the threshold is between public and private and, and what kinds of expectations and rights do we have of what kind of privacy do we know we need and want. Uh, that line doesn't, st it doesn't stay put, right? It's not the same line that it was in ancient Greece. It's not the same line uh, um, in contemporary Hong Kong as it was a year ago in Hong Kong, right? And so, and it's not the same line in the United States now as it was a, a year ago, um, because now, there are people who are protesting having to wear masks in public. So a bare face in public right now is somehow uh, um, an assertion of a, a, a privacy over publicness, right? So somebody refusing to wear a mask in public, those of us who, who take that as a horror, right? That is somebody asserting privateness in public by bearing the, the, the face. And so this, the dynamic between public and private that these uh, artists I surveyed here, their like presumption is that it is more private to hide the face, and then that's flipped over now because of the pandemic, where it seems to be a kind of private action to bear the face. Um, but I didn't want to get into that in the talk because I, I was admonished to keep it uplifting, and so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. I don't know if you can answer the next question. How does Facebook plant cookies in my browser, even though I'm not using it, even if I purge those cookies manually? They reappear minutes later, even if I haven't visited any websites in the interim. Is there a way to prevent this? I have no idea. Yeah, that, I, I don't I, know. That might be a question for a computer scientist who's very well versed in Facebook and, and social media. So we're going to maybe uh, send that out to somebody else here. Um, okay, but you you mentioned you know how the um, uh, the programs recognize symmetry and that you had a friend that um, had uh, uh, palsy and and you know the kind of deformities that come with that. The question here is uh, how does facial surgery, like plastic surgery, for instance, a full facelift affect um, the ability of the programs to recognize you? I mean, it affects them, their ability to recognize you, right? And so in the scenario where, let's say, in the next year, everybody's flying again, and JetBlue is using exclusively the face-based um, um, uh, boarding passes, and it, like, identifies you because of a government ID picture that it either 
they've accessed the database because they can through TSA, or you've provided a copy of your driver's license or passport. But if your face looks substantially different um, between the government ID, you know, and also like some people in some states, um, I used to live in South Carolina, the driver's license lasts 10 years. And like, so somebody's face can change a bit over 10 years just because the world right. wears upon us. Um, but if you have that, you know, if you have extensive plastic surgery for any number of reasons that you would, um, or in my friend's case where he had Bell, Bell's palsy for six months and then it, and it went away, in that situation, then the, the face-based uh, boarding pass would fail and then you have to fumble to get out a printed one or the one on your phone and, and, and then you'd have a problem getting your phone probably and you have to use your thumb and, and so. But I, I, I want to like continue to stress that, that it's the, the biometric using your thumb on the phone is training, uh, uh, you know what I mean? it's training a surveillance machine learning algorithm. You know, giving your fingerprints to, to, to these devices isn't, isn't great either. Um, although I use it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on the sunglasses that block the infrared light in facial recognition? Oh, oh so I was going to mention that one. Yeah. So this one's really great. Um, uh, uh, there's a, 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 another artist who does these sunglasses that when a, an infrared camera, so a night vision camera, hits the sunglasses, they reflect. So they look like normal sunglasses under um, normal optical light, like normal cameras like we're using right now. They would look like just like regular sunglasses. Um, but under an infrared camera or a night vision camera, they like reflect this this blinding. So the, the, that part of the face would be just this blinding. It's mm -hmm. a terrifying image. I, 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 that's a good question. I should have brought that one in and, and, and mentioned it. And so it, it blinds night vision cameras. Um, so so I, I, that project is funny, you know. <laughs> yeah, so then there is no recognition, right? If you have the- it, Right, so that's, uh, right. So the, the key, so the camera and the, the facial recognition system are two different things, right? So a, an infrared, an, an, a camera that can see at night sees different um, um, infrared, right? It sees different range of, of radiation. And these sunglasses have a, a coating on it that when, that can't like it reflects out and blinds that camera. So then there wouldn't be facial recognition if you took that footage and ran it through a facial recognition um, machine looking for faces in it because it, it would just be this white blinding spot on top of the body. Yeah. The next question is also about glasses, but whether the, uh, um, the programs can distinguish between glasses and sunglasses. And I noticed that on my, you know, I have facial recognition on my phone too. Uh -huh. And I noticed that on mine, sometimes it actually does recognize it. If I have sunglasses on and often it doesn't. Um, is that just something where the symmetry goes away <laughs> or is not enough information? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're just, you know, they're getting better at it. You know, and the, look, the whole point is that, that this is machines that are learning and we ought to think about how we interact with machines that are learning <laughs> yeah. as, as kind of attentively as possible, you know? And so the, the, the shock factor of these, you know, this series of jokes that I, 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 visual jokes that I shared with you, the shock factor is to be more attentive to that, right? You know? That if you if you're using your face to get into your iPhone and you wear sunglasses sometimes and and not other times and glasses sometimes and not other times and it gets better at recognizing you, um, you're training an algorithm that's good yeah. at at that job, and you know. Which is a good point, and actually gets me to our next question here. When would you recommend that we take evasive action so our faces are not recognized? Since that's now becoming everyday life, pretty much, you know, we have facial or the potential for facial recognition anywhere. Um, is there any particular situation where you would re recommend taking evasive uh, actions? I and so I, I mentioned a couple toward the end of the, the the talk, and that was in protest actions. Yeah. Uh, in in Hong Kong, it was a matter of of a very a very serious matter in in Hong Kong for people to not be identified. In participating in those, and the same in in Santiago, and and from people reporting from various places in the U.S. during the, the, the summer protests that we're having here, it seems like you, you you would be better off if you were participating in in a protest. You would be better off not being recognized. 
Um, and again, you know, the thing about the, the hair and makeup scheme, like I said, if you're walking around with that funny hair and makeup scheme, police who are undercover or not undercover would know what you're up to, right? And so it's only camouflage for the machines. And so, you know, that then you need different strategies for camouflaging for yourself from machines and from, from human uh, eyeball vision. Um, and then otherwise, I, I leave it up to people's own political and ethical choices to decide when it is that they <laughs> feel like they need to be a, 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 to evade um, uh, being surveilled in public. Basically, when you want to really be private, right, in, instead of being public. Um, coming back to social media, what tactics or strategies do you use to inform students who are active on social media that they are unknowingly participating in their own invasion of privacy? Mm -hmm. A lot of it is is teaching about these things early in my classes. Um, so most of my classes that I've been teaching lately are broadly on this this kind of subject of digital culture or um, digital rhetoric and these sorts of things. And so they tend to be front loaded at the beginning, early in the classes um, to encourage people to be like, all of it is about encouraging people to be more attentive and, and thoughtful, but more experimental, right? Like in their practices with um, all these machines be more mindful right and, and just be aware of it that this is happening because um the the particular this particular attendee what I was mentioning we seem to be getting more desensitized uh, and and it's almost normal right we're not even thinking about it anymore that this might be happening in the in the background and when i put up my uh, phone to to unlock it i certainly don't necessarily think um you know that it um that it i teach the phone you know with the example mm -hmm. with the sunglasses that mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's working better even though i'm wearing now sunglasses you know i don't necessarily even think about it anymore it's just almost everyday life so to be more mindful i think would be would be a good um good thing okay um so the next question you mentioned the the tropes in your uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, the Greek reference to it. Um, so the next question is related to the tropes. Um, the question is about how you think this uh, tactical surveillance hacking uh, changes uh, how we understand tropes themselves. And uh, do you, for example, do you think about tropes differently mm -hmm. after having done this project? Mm -hmm. I do, and and so. Uh, uh, as somebody who was trained in rhetoric who then gets got interested in grad school in technology and not the other way around um i, I think the, the this journey through thinking about technology has put me in line with a lot of contemporary theorists of rhetoric who have begun to maybe disarticulate um a lot of the, the historical tools of of theorizing rhetoric from an investment in, in in strictly speech or writing, right? So when Quintilian is talking about uh, um, his understanding what, of the Greek term trope, he's talking about uses of language, right? In, in the ordinary sense, he's an orator. He's talking about oration, talking, what we're doing right now. And so as contemporary rhetoric starts to, to think about other ways of thinking about rhetoric, um, and I'm thinking, when I mention the heliotropic uh, plants, this is, I'm borrowing this from a couple other people, um, George Kennedy and, and one of my, one of the people I worked with in grad school, John Mucklebauer. And these are people who are reminding us that, that these are things that are, are naturally occurring phenomena and also technically occurring phenomena, right? Like in, in, in the technologies. And so if you think about tropes in, in that way, then you don't think about, uh, transferring a term that belongs to language into a different area, but thinking about troping as something that happens all over the place, turning. It's just turning, right? It's, it's just a heliotropic plant is a plant that turns toward the sun throughout the day. Um, if you think about tropes in that like real kind of almost materialized version, then it changes how you approach their existence and occurrence in language. Because then you're thinking about persuasion as a more you know, almost gut, right? You know, it's more about affect and, and bodily change and those sorts of things. And very 
this is a very popular topic in, in rhetorical theory now, and we could go off on that, but I think I'll stop there. And <laughs> very interesting. If you have more questions uh, for Dr. Stagliani, feel free to contact him. He had his email address on the uh, slide. Um, okay, next question. So we talked a little bit about what happens if you, like, for example, change your Facebook for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and uh, we still log into many of our softwares, for example, of this um, traditional login credentials, so you know, mm -hmm. username and password. Uh, even though our phones and smart devices are starting to switch over to either fingerprints or not the, the facial recognition. So with the login credentials, we often have issues that they get um, compromised mm -hmm. on a relatively regular basis, unfortunately. And the question here is, what happens when biometrics are compromised? Uh, the, the face and digital print cannot really be changed. Right. Right. Um, and, and that was kind of one of the, the punchlines of that one project, Leonardo Savaggio's project, where it, it's kind of a way of concealing yourself by everybody putting on his face. But there's also a kind of subtle subcurrent of that one um, where he's like hacking his own face, right? So I can put on his face if I print it. And if I happen to get a hold of his phone, um, then I presumably might have a chance at getting into his phone. I might not. I mean, the mask does have, you know, the eye holes cut out and all that sort of stuff. But so, I mean, the, the, the answer to what happens when biometrics get hacked, I don't know, um, but it, it, it probably won't be great. You know, it'll be bad. Um, and, but the, the question is phrased right. When is the, <laughs> when is the question, not if, you know, and, and so, you know, we build a security system, there's exploits, and that's just the way it works. And what you showed earlier, where somebody you know, was uh, kind of selling their, their own face. Um, that's what I mean, that's a value. Ah, that's a, yeah. That could technically be used into, uh, for hacking, right, if you really wanted to. So, um, but then I encourage anyone to do that. Um, so coming back to your Hong Kong example with the drone surveillance, um, the question here is, uh, if uh, there are some blockers such as uh, sunglasses, eyeglasses, caps, will that do anything about it? And the, 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 the follow-up question to that is just more standard makeup, like foundation concealers and those kind of things. Do they make a difference in those kind of um, surveillance or kind of face recognition tools? I mean, limiting the amount of face that, that it can get when it's trying to determine whether in the image that it's seeing uh, um, is a face, whether there's a face there or several faces or what, limiting the amount um, or multiplying it, right? So that one head mounted projector does the opposite tack. It multiplies instead of limiting, but uh, it, it's looking for a certain number of symmetries that it defines as a face. So if you have a baseball cap pulled down and you're looking down when the drone flies by, the drone won't see you in the same way that it, because it's a camera, the camera won't see you. Um, ordinary foundation, I don't know, I don't think so. I mean, um, but foundations that if it was night vision cameras, if they had something in it that reflected, I guess that would be aluminum. Um, but I don't know if you would want to put that on your skin. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, we're talking a lot about the dangers and problems with uh, the facial recognition and, and the, the more public face that you're uh, becoming uh, all the time, really. Um, the next question is really related to some of the uh, benefits of facial recognition in finding missing people or catching criminals. And the question is, do you have any examples or stories on that? Well, I, 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 my examples of the benefits were that, that our lives are significantly more convenient with all of these network machine learning devices in our lives, right? Uh, you can avoid traffic jams, and, and especially in places like South Florida, that's, that's a necessary con tool of convenience. Um, it is easier, I guess, to hold your phone in front of your face to unlock it. Um, it would be easier at the airport if you just kind of walk through, you know, that the, 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 the example of the constant scanning, getting on and off trains in China um, was used by the New York Times to, to raise alarm about their, their surveillance state. But anybody who's like had to fumble with turnstile systems, getting on and off trains and like get your pass out and tap it just the right way 
or mm -hmm. worse, like having to put the card through and grab the card on the other side and get like fumble to put money in, all those different things just to get like on the train and you're running late for work. That's that's a benefit. I mean, the, the question was even more ambitious, um, you know, uh, uh, about finding missing per mer missing persons and, and catching criminals and and. But I, I guess I'm more mundane in, in, you know, what I think about. And, and I think they, they, it is a benefit to having these things in our lives. And anyway, we're not getting rid of them. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we talked a lot about the facial recognition and the, and the phones that use them. But phones also have like GPAs and, and various location devices in it. Um, do you have any knowledge and can you talk about uh, the phones uh, tracking your movement habits? Yeah, and that's, that's what the example of the, the phones in, in the, the wagon was about, right? And so a couple of months ago, I, I would say early, I, like a lot of people have lost any sense of time I, I this year, um, but it was earlier this year, the New York Times did an incredible, uh, on their website. So it was one of their digital digital pieces that wasn't published in the um, print newspaper because it was interactive. But they found they could get from commercial data vendors uh, cell phone data, right? Anonymized cell phone data, but they bought commercial uh, uh, commercially for this, this, this research a bunch of data in Northern Virginia and DC and they were able to track you know, White House personnel. It was supposed to be anonymized, but they could say like, you know, we know that so-and-so, I forget who it was, lives in this neighborhood, and we saw that this cell phone leaves this house, goes over to the White House, spends all day at the White House, goes back, and like, and this is just, it, it's anonymized data. So th these phones, I mean, really, they tell a lot about you, even when it's anonymized. Um, and so it's worth thinking about. Yeah. You know, it is. How not to be seen isn't just your face, right? Right, right. Okay, we are unfortunately out of, uh, out of time. We do have a few more questions, Tony. We're going to ask you to answer those offline and then we're going to post those together with a report. Oh, okay. um, type the answers, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll let you know. So thank you very much for everybody who was calling in. Uh, we hope to see you again next week. And thank you again, uh, Tony. Very interesting presentation. Thank you all. Bye.